Michelle Alexander <clears throat> wrote a great book. In that book, she described the problem. What we need to be talking about now is the solution. You know, and in order to talk about the solution, we're going to have to take control of this whole narrative about justice and about what's fair and all this poppycock man that they put in our heads from the time that we were in kindergarten. You know, about this and all this talk about this being an exceptional nation. <laughs> you know. We have to change this narrative. We have to take control of this narrative. We can't, as long as we continue to talk using their language and their definitions of what reality is, we're lost. The question becomes for us now, in, in terms of solutions, is how do we get rid of all of these things that divide us, all of these disconnects? We have so many different views of what it is that should be done, but what we lack, I think, is a common vision. And the Bible says without vision, the people perish. We don't have a common vision. For the last 40 years, in New York State, and probably around the country, we have had what a friend of mine calls boutique activism. Boutique activism is when everybody picks out a piece of the problem and focuses on that part of the problem. It could be a hundred people working on drug policy. And the only ones they talk to are the funders. They don't talk to one another. They don't talk to one another. There's no horizontal integration. Only thing they're concerned about is where the funding is coming from. Now those of us that have been out here and worked with these organizations, if you go around and ask these organizations what is the one thing that they've done to improve the conditions of the people that they're working for and the communities that they're working for, for the most part, you're going to get silence. You're going to get silence. And I'm not knocking these organizations, you know, because movement and the consciousness it takes to, to build movement is a process, right? We try reform, but we've tried it for 40 years and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The prison population went from, in 1970, from 300,000 to 2.4 million today the largest prison population in the history of humankind. And they say, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. Right? So we need to change, and we need fundamental change. Now listen, as Cornell said, you know, we don't agree on everything. I've been to prison since I was 16 years old. I've been in state prison, I've been in federal prison, and I was born in Harlem Hospital. You know, so I was born into a prison. You know, you know. So when I, talk about, when I talk about prison, I'm not talking about something from an academic perspective. I'm talking about, man, I experienced this. You understand? Know Solitary confinement, I experienced that. Right? Denial of the right to vote and being treated like a piece of garbage, I've experienced that, man. And so, I was in Attica the year before Attica went up. And we organized. And we came together. 
there was everything, every, everybody in there, I mean, every movement that was taking place in the streets, the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, the Weathermen, the SDS, all of them were in there. And as we began to educate and organize ourselves, we realized, man, that we had to get rid of that whole alphabet soup of Black Panthers, BLA, Young Lords, Weathermen, SDS, and we got rid of all those labels and we came together as one and we called ourselves the People's Party. The People's Party. And that's, and that's what you saw when Attica went up. That's what you saw in that yard. Fortunately, I was shipped out of there six days before the place went up. But the preparation that went into building, the, the solidarity that we had took place for a year before that, man. You know, it took place, it came out of the tombs. You know, when the tombs went up in smoke and they moved us all to Attica. But now out there on the West Coast, they doing the same thing. They eliminating all those labels. White, black, Latino, Asian, Indian. And they've agreed to eliminate them so that they can begin to speak in one voice, just like the people that have them in them cages. They speak in one voice. All the people in power during Attica Rebellion, they spoke in one voice, right? And they met prisoners that spoke in one voice. Why is it that we don't seem to learn that lesson, man? Why is it we continue to, 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 to see ourselves as the only right way why can't we connect the dots? We talk about prison, man. Like I say, I've been in prison. The only thing a prisoner wants is out. He don't want no flat screen TVs in the visiting room. He don't want no, yo, children play pens. He wants out. He wants to go to his family, huh? He wants to out. That's what prisoners want. So everybody that's working on issues of reform and trying to make the prison a better place to live, listen, that's not what prisoners want, right? And this whole issue that these false dichotomies that we keep engaging in, man, children in prison, women in prison, old people in prison, they are human beings in cages. That's what they are. That's what they all have in common. They're human beings in cages, man. You know, and this is what we got to, we got to start, we got to take control of this language, man. We got to take control of this narrative, man. We got to start eliminating the things that disconnect us, that divide us. You know, until we do that, until we begin to connect the dots, we are finished. We ain't going nowhere. The only movement we're going to have, in the words of my friend Jamal Joseph, is a bowel movement. Thank you.